Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı, ne fazla ne az. Can I feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime? A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varm Blog. And today we're talking to Steve Mann, co-editor of Strange Matters magazine, which is part of the Strange Matters co-op, um, of which you are also a member. And um, we are going to talk about inflation. And this topic in normal times is, how do you say, unsexy unless you're usually a, some weird gold bug who will start ranting about <laughs> inflation. Um, but we've had not hyperinflation, but serious inflation for over a year. And the liberal economistic predictions on this inflation were wrong. As soon as it began, we immediately heard that it would be very temporary. It was not. Um, and so we've been kind of scrounging to figure that out. Meanwhile, as your article touches on uh, notes towards a for the theory of inflation, um, you point out that the Fed has kind of semi-quietly abandoned the classical monetarist theory of inflation, um, even though it is supposedly fighting, in, uh, fighting inflation by raising interest rates. Although I will point out that its justification for doing so is not the monetarist justification and in fact, it's a little bit more naked than I'm used to the Fed being because they because Powell explicitly talked about labor being too strong, um, mm -hmm. uh, which means, folks, Powell's saying that the, we have to we have to save the economy and the recovery by causing a mini recession. <laughs> yeah, um, well, we may. We may. He says, like, I hope I don't have to initiate unilaterally a recession, but I reserve the right to. Right, basically, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I mean, it's interesting because the classical monetarist, and I'm going to let you explain all these theories, but the classical monetarist theory of inflation is you have an overheated uh, market created by um, uh, too low of a of a bank to bank lending rate. You raise that up, that should, in theory, encourage people to save and not borrow, which will do two functions. It will uh, shore up individual bank investment, and it will um, reduce the monetary supply. However, even during the Volcker shock, that isn't what happened. Anyone who studied economics knows that it isn't what happened, and they've been kind of quietly since probably the early 90s and definitely since 2007 trying to figure out what they can possibly do about inflation pressures um uh also i think people need to understand the general what the general inflation rates targeted at what 2 to 3% right and we're at somewhere we're, between we have a cpi of 7.9% Right. So we're double what's expected. And I do remember very early on uh, some MMT are saying that we could get as high as 10 percent general inflation uh, without there being much of a crisis. Um, they have all walked that back. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Nobody's sitting that now. <laughs> um, I don't know why they thought that in the first place. That's that. That's one of the predictions I would see said, and I'm like, are we in agreement that the '70s happened or not? Like, <laughs> but okay. That's where we are now. So, Steve, I'm going to really kind of leap things over to you. Um, what is the problem with our understanding of inflation? Is it like the evangelical mind? Um, the crisis of the evangelical mind is that there isn't one, and the crisis of our understanding of inflation is that there isn't one. <laughs> um, if you listen to Daniel Tarullo, who I mm -hmm. noted in my paper, is a he's a former board of governors, uh, which is like the governing body of the, the Federal Reserve, he, when asked about it, and also in a talk he gave, he basically said, we don't have any functional theory of inflation. We just have rules about what to do if you see it. And sometimes the rules work, but most, most of the time they don't. Right. So the big example is you do the Volcker shock and you don't see a decrease in inflation for three years and you don't see a real decrease in the a real significant decrease in inflation until like 1987. So, right. yeah. So you have the our central bank is saying they don't really know um, what causes inflation, much less what are the appropriate tools to deal with it. So you should you should learn something about like the fundamental causes of something before devising tools to try and deal with it. Usually, and one would think, so have, right? Yeah, so it's like a little bit like finding out that your airplane like doesn't have like pilots who really went through flight school or something. Well, I mean, I, I, I not to sound like a anti psychiatric a psychiatric crank, but it's kind of like the way we treat mental health, which is a cluster of symptoms for which we do not even try to understand the pathology for, and thus we treat many things that are probably complex reactions, would one or two thir sets of tools until very recently. And seemingly that's the case with inflation. Um, so let's talk about, though, the standard, I described the standard monetarist theory, the neoclassical monetarist theory coming out of Chicago. It's not the only theory. Um, but it's based on an even more basic theory, right, that you describe in your paper, which is a quantity of money theory. So you want to talk about that? This is what I was taught in school, actually. I remember I remember even, like, DuckTales episodes about this. <laughs> For real. Like, yeah. There's... Well, maybe I should – Um, I could try and give, like, a short summary of my paper because mm -hmm. um, it starts out with many of these themes. Um, so – yeah, so 20, 2020 to 2022, all of the existing theories of inflation, the major ones that you hear about in the news mixed together often, um, none of them really fa fared very well when, when you look at the data and versus what they're saying. So you had quantity theory of money people who say, if you track a certain monetary aggregate, you should be able to predict where prices will go. So if there's more money in the economy, whether it's being used to spend, uh, being spent to buy things or not, either it has already caused inflation, which is an inflation I should define as a general rise in prices over a certain time, an arbitrary period of time. So either it's already caused inflation or it will cause inflation just by it being out there. So that's sort of like the the um, the uh, the hard form of the quantity theory of money says that the more money that is out there, et cetera, is paribus, the more likely it is to cause inflation. And there are more modified versions of quantity theory, but that is like the main one. Um, and so those people on, so while the inflation was happening from 2020 to now, you had people on the quantity theory of money side who have been saying for literally over a decade that like, we're going to have tremendous inflation. It's going to go to a thousand percent because the Fed's balance sheet has expanded, you know, however as many times as it has, whatever their chosen aggregate uh, is. Um, mm -hmm. And a clock that is, you know, broken is right twice a day. So eventually they were right, but for 10 years they weren't. And they didn't, they paid no theoretical price for that. So that's one thing. So that doesn't mean that they have a working theory. And then on the other side of things, there were more um, 
nuanced takes, I would say, from people who subscribe to what are called the push and the pull theories of, of inflation, whereby you have the demand pull, which says that, well, there's too many, there's too much money chasing too few goods, or there's too much money chasing too little productive capacity in the economy to absorb all of the purchasing power. So that's like the demand pull story. And there's the cost push story, which says, well, companies who companies who create the output had so many orders coming in that they couldn't, um, they had no choice but to raise prices eventually because of the um, like increase in say unit labor costs that they were experiencing from like people not showing up to work or just being told to stay home because of the shutdowns and quarantines and whatnot. And there's some truth to that, but it's mm -hmm. not the whole story. And there are other, there's another group of theorists who kind of, uh, that in my paper I called the hybrid demand pull cost push theorists who mix it together and say, on the one hand, there was demand pull stuff going on from like excessive um, in their in some of their views, excessive like uh, stimulus checks and whatnot, winding up in people's hands who have nothing to do but buy things on Amazon, and so they're because of all the money they had, it bid up prices somehow. And then on the other side of things, you had increasing costs from like transportation and lack of trucking to get things to where they need to be to be sold, et cetera, going on at the same time. And those people will, um, the hybrid demand pull cost push theorists will kind of mix in language from both of those schools of inflation theory um, to, to make their case. And there's, there's, you know, there's much to be gained from kind of sifting through that, but they, they put it forward in a very confusing way. Okay, so, so yeah. So to sum up, we have quantity theory, that's Milton Friedman, monetarist. Most Austrians, I think. That's true, Austrians are interesting. We'll come back there. Um, we have demand pool theories, that's... Uh, you know, Keynes. that will be like, yeah, Keynes, at times Keynes. So like in his book, How to Pay for the War, mm -hmm. um, he's mostly in a demand pool state of mind. He's trying to say like, in order to prepare for World War II, we have to basically control how much money is in people's pockets so that they don't bid up the prices of like necessary war materials and stuff. And um, so we have to offer them bond bonds at so many percent so that they'll buy those instead of buying like consumption goods or something that our militaries need. Right. So we have cost push theories, which are associated with Neo and post Keynesians uh, like Kalecki. Uh, Joan Robinson, um, mm -hmm. uh, Keynes, sometimes himself, apparently. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember both theories being in Keynes um, and not being clear when you would pick one or the other as a driving factor. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I, um, I struggled between placing him in the demand pole or the hybrid camp. Mm -hmm. But I ultimately went with demand pole. Some of his like most seminal works, he's mostly in that frame. All right, so then we have modern monetary theorist uh, theory. So we have, I'm going to say, I don't think there is a general consensus amongst modern monetary theorists on inflation. However, when I talk to them, they insist that there is. But when I read them, I don't think they're saying the same thing. So we'll come back to that. Um, so that's going to be uh, Stephanie Kelton, Bill Minchel, Randall Ray. Uh, I noticed that you don't put Warren Mosler in here. Uh, That's, why is that? That might be that might be a special case because, um, as I think you noted before we started, um, he actually thinks that the government sets all prices through being the buyer of last resort, right? Somehow through um, I don't and know it, through like the Defense Production Act or something, right? It's uh. By I'm setting the about... by setting the price of money, they somehow have um, by setting the price more, of more, money, than, more it... than just indirect control over everything. Right, and and this applies according to Sam Kangerlu, who explained this to me because he's one of more Mosler's uh, people. Uh, this applies to commodities outside of government purchase. So when they buy Saudi Arabia, 
the the U.S. is accepting the U.S. government is accepting or rejecting the general price. Um, the other example they give is uh, labor. Actually, that semi skilled labor is is um, has a has a kind of a tractor to a general to a minimum price based on the, the what the feds will pay as a minimum. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's that's probably true, actually. But that's there's that that makes sense because if you have one purchaser of the most labor in the United States that's semi skilled, it actually in any given market within the U.S., it really will be the government. Um, so there's that's, mm-hmm. if you if you want to be very generous, you could say that Mosler was onto something in the sense that um, they could be a government could definitely exercise its monopsonist power and purchase all of a needed type of input for a supply chain or something and right. distribute it amongst them at you know at cost or something and but say I, I, this is just going to be what the price they're going to use price controls like they could do you could make the case that like okay in limited scenarios what Moser was kind of getting onto was um maybe that like not that their ability to set the price of money was per se the linkage for government being the ultimate price setter but rather that they did things like the defense production act or the price controls during world war ii or something but i don't think he's saying but that's not what he's saying i mean what he's saying is basically since the government's the largest purchaser of any given commodity which is i don't think true um (laughs) that that it back because as largest purchaser it has negotiation prices kind of like how insurance sets the minimum price for for uh health care through negotiation but i can't find how that could possibly be true except in labor um and only then semi-skilled labor that's that's curtailed within a state so you're not dealing with international competition there like um and when you start yeah. talking about like oil, I'm like, so you're telling me the U.S. government sets the world price for oil because they accept or reject what OPEC offers them? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, just um, no. <laughs> um, and I actually heard, this is where I realized there was a division in MNT. I heard this stated once um, around uh, New Year's and Stephanie Kelton kind of backed away as like i don't totally agree with that um and and kind of went off and then but when i had someone come on my show to talk about mmt's theory of inflation i got that theory as the theory that supposedly all agreed on and i'm like i don't think that's true mm-hmm. um maybe there's a few different maybe, ones right yeah. so let's talk about the different hybrid theories because there's multiple theories right here mm-hmm. well the so, one i spend most of the time on Oh, mm-hmm. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The one I spend most of my time on for as far as the hybrid theories is uh, the one developed by Mark Lavoie, who is a post-Keynesian economist. And in one of his papers, he is going through kind of a Koletskian distributional theory of inflation, where it's a conflict between workers and bosses over, like, say, union no- negotiations over wages on one side, and then threats to increase prices by the bosses in response to that, unless they lower their offer uh, in uh, in response to the threat. And so it's kind of like an arms race scenario between, well, if you guys end up getting a higher wage, we're just going to raise prices eventually, either right away or a little by little over time, such that over the course of those years, it will just even out for us and we can continue getting the same revenue. What's interesting about this is this is a uh, Kalecki really like worked out what a bunch of Swedish Keynesian Marxo hybrid people tried to work out in the uh, right after World War II. And I know it sounds strange to say that there is Keynesian Marx and hybrid since they have fundamental disagreements on everything, but that's what they're trying to do. And Kalecki really kind of works out how that might be possible. And the idea is it's you, you might hear this described as the class struggle theory of the business cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what drives inflation, and it's totally endogenous to to capital. So inflation is going to happen regardless of of external shock. But it is a kind of 
it is both a demand cost and a push pull theory, right? So there's that. Yeah. So um, like on the one, it's demand pull in the sense that if workers were to get their wage increased, so they'll have more money in their pocket, ceteris paribus, all holding all, all else equal, um, that money may well be spent as effective demand on things, which will bid up the price of other goods and services. Right. So, so one thing I'm seeing here is basically nobody's a pure cost push theorist. It's pretty <laughs> rare. Uh, well, <laughs> except for, you know, like uh, possibly me. <laughs> later right, on right, uh, right. Uh, um, we'll, get, we'll get to that okay so but then you have so we have the kind of standard kalecki uh uh lavoy lavois lavois yeah lavois sorry i'm bad at french people this has been an ongoing conversation about how bad i am at french um lavois uh model and then you have sort of the hybrid model of kelton randall ray and bill mitchell and i think bill mitchell probably has the clearest explanation of what their theory is. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. So uh, Bill Mitchell, the MMT Bill Mitchell, by the way. Yeah, um, MMT Bill Mitchell, <laughs> who also is a Marxist hybridist, but in a completely different way than the post Keynesian yeah, Marxist hybrids we're Mitchell. talking about. Yeah. He's a Mar um, he, what he likes about uh, Marxism is nationalism. <laughs> so he, um, he and three other offers... Uh, I, I think one, another one was Randall Ray. Mm -hmm. uh, they they wrote a textbook and they claim to have a unified theory that brings together demand pull and cost push into one like unified thing, which is really what I was looking for. So I was excited. But then mm -hmm. I read the textbook and they have a bunch of caveats that say like, well, actually, um, so while it's true that cost push seems to be like a... Um, sort of a spark for larger infl inflationary um, events, I think is their terminology. Like when it, like when you have an inflationary period that lasts longer than like just one um, accounting period, basically like one economic quarter, they say, mm -hmm. okay, that's an, that's an inflationary process. And it's being generated by a combination of what we think is, what we like to refer to as demand pull and cost push. But really, though, it's cost push. It only it only accelerates, they say, if there is a cost push that is kind of grounded in a more wage led wage price spiral. So if they have like they're they're kind of mixing together some ideas from like Lava actually, okay. and um, the more demand pull side of things to say like, well, you. Cost push can result in inflationary processes, but only if it's undergirded by a wage price spiral that's getting bid up by, like, say, like unions and bosses fighting or something. Right. So I'm going to go then, ahead. But, and... then, but then they go on to say, they admit to say that it's very difficult to tell one from the other and that they don't right. have really an analytic tool set to do that. So you have you have two possible explanations that are kind of operating in a feedback loop and discerning which is the the initial cause what has causal impetus is almost impossible under this theory. And before people ask me because I know it's going to come up, people are going to go, "Well, Varn, this is a, you know, you mostly talk about Marxism, so why are you talking about Marx's theory of inflation?" And it is because uh the Kalecki theory of inflation has generally been used by social democratic Marxists, but Marx's theory of inflation more or less doesn't exist. Um, Marx pretty much seems to indicate that under conditions of commodity money, which is not the conditions we currently live in. Um, <laughs> so that's a whole nother thing. Uh, all things being equal, the value of money are decrease would decrease or increase. Uh, excuse me. The value of money would decrease, and we would have inflation with an increased money supply. But notice here, there's a bunch of assumptions. All things being equal, which they never are, and uh, commodity money. He's not talking about credit or bank money at all. 
um, mm. our, our fiat currency, which he mentioned some other places, but doesn't really even deal with. He essentially thinks fiat currency would cause um, inflation because of the need to to trade internationally would make it very weak. No, no state in Europe could have been an autarky. And there you go. Um, uh, there are some things to notice about this. Uh, Marx lived in a time period of a hundred years with amazing price stability. Like, um, and that we are not under direct commodity money. All right. Like, I think we all agree on that, right? Like no one's like telling me secretly that fiat money is actually commodity money somehow that there's a bait and switch somewhere. And, um, <laughs> all right. Um, so I guess this leads us to a question though. I mean, I, I, your paper pointed out something that I have thought about, but never really gotten into, gotten into because Another thing Marx doesn't really talk about that much directly is individual prices. Marx only talks about aggregate prices and uh, um, all the prices in a system and uh, basically that as an accounting can get you something like the value of exploited labor, but it's real values. It's not nominal values. And so like, it's like trying to figure it out when you're dealing with individual prices and actual money is not going to work. And uh, while the econophysicist school of Marxism has been, has been using statistical arguments to prove there is a, a value attractor to prices in aggregate, it is not predictive of individual price at all. So no one in Marxism argues that who has who has much understanding of the actual economy, because that would mean that like literally the markup will be consistent in the way that you could predict. And it's not um, uh, the markup being the cost of selling versus the cost of labor. Um, also that also makes Marxism not make a lot of sense because part of Marx's point is money hides the, the money exchange actually hides the amount of exploitation going on. Um, so I just want to answer that for my Marxist friends who are like, why are you talking about Marx? Because he doesn't really go into this. The Kalecki answer was the attempt from someone to kind of hybridize that school with Keynes and come up with an answer for modern inflation. And you will notice the class struggle theory of business cycle does imply some Marxist conflict theory involved in that. Um, uh, why doesn't the Kalecki model work, though? Why isn't it predictive? Because it's not, but I've, I've never well, actually, like, why isn't it? <laughs> yeah. When I was reading through Mark Lavoie's paper, I'm like, okay, all of this seems really intuitive for, certainly for one firm, maybe mm -hmm. even a firm and um, its competitor. Uh, so a lot of, he says, but like, in, sorry, a lot of it makes sense for like, one or two firms or a few, or maybe a couple, maybe several firms, but um, how does it become a economy-wide phenomenon? Because a few companies raising their prices won't put a dent. They'll just be a blip, if, if that, in an index of prices that we use for inflation like CPI. So it has to get to the whole economy somehow. So how does that happen if it's like workers at one firm versus their boss, et cetera. And he says, well, it has to do with the informational diffusion uh, parameter in this model that he made, whereby workers and sets of other workers and bosses at companies adjacent to the one where the conflict is going on will see what the result is and modify their negotiating tactics accordingly, such that either it goes outside of a steady state or back into the steady state. So you have like kind of the strength, the balance of forces between the class, classes in the class warfare. And then you also have their ability to disseminate information or diffuse it into the rest of the economy and get other people to negotiate on similar terms. And then are those terms enough to shift things out of whack from where they had been going in terms of prices? Or uh, are they, is it enough to be sort of absorbed by the system at large and just goes back into a steady state. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, and, and I think one of the interesting things I think we can deduce from that, that point that I was saying that Marx is operating at a time 
a relatively stable monetary value for like a hundred years. I, but people really need to get that through their head. It was a long time. Like a horse was like 50 bucks for like a hundred years. <laughs> um, but I should add, <laughs> um, I should add that. So I was going through the, the not the Kolesky model, the, mm. the Lavoie model. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well that, that really makes a lot of intuitive sense to me, but I'm just like, does it actually happen though? Right. And I mean, so I'm just like, okay, well, Certainly, I mean, you can have an inflationary process going on for the whole economy, and within that, there's certainly a good deal of class conflict going on at the same time. But is the is the latter causing the former? Right. And we don't really see that so much as we do see other things like, say, price increases along a supply chain from one uh, person whose job it is to set prices interacting with another person at the someone upstream or downstream of them whose mm -hmm. job is to set prices I, i've also been fascinated by the fact that that model has no place in it to talk about rents which are a major driver of, of monetary exchanges and matter for prices yeah. right like they really do yeah so yeah, absolutely um, it's like even if let's say let's say lavois model is accurate and it does explain things so if rents were to go up commensurately so that all of like the workers are able to negotiate their higher wages and what let's say demand pull is true. So that means that rent either didn't go up as much or it didn't go up at all or it, it like it basically the like rent is the biggest uh, cost for most workers. It still is. And if that just stays put, yeah, okay, maybe it would be inflationary. If it goes, if it increases, then there would be less money in, the, in this model. You right, it should be, be it should, rents should be deflationary, but they are not. In, yeah, in, <laughs> in either case, though, it should be included. Right. If we're going to use like a demand pull. Right. Model. So this brings us to your point about, uh, I think, your point, J uh, JW Mason's point. That to to really talk about um, inflation, you need a you need a theory of prices. Now we gave you Warren Moser's theory of prices, which is basically their backdoor set by the government purchasing power, um, which I don't find a lot of evidence <laughs> for. But um, I've always thought about that because I'm like. If that's true, why don't they just admit they can do price controls? Like, um, <laughs> is that just class warfare then? And is that what you're implying? Like, um, but okay, this means that we do have to answer the question. Um, wh who sets prices and what are the price rules? Now, and, and we need to not talk about vague aggregates here. I mean, so like. For example, I will break out my labor theory of value and talk about an attractor to to overall all prices in the economy, you know, figuring out an exploitation rate for that. Sure, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't actually give you a specific theory of prices either. And so one of the fascinating things I learned many, many years ago in both classical and neoclassical economics is price setting is like a here be dragons of economics <laughs> like like no one really wants to talk about it because all the theories that people have had priorly like with inflation seem to fall apart in practice marginalism doesn't seem to actually hold um like i said no one thinks labor theory of value is labor theory of price etc and so forth so uh what were your guidelines for dealing with this well, I look to, there is a tradition in economics starting from the 20s and 30s where people, um, institutional economists, like uh, uh, that's a, stool, a school of thought in economics, they would go and do surveys of business managers to figure out like, hey, you guys seem to be setting prices, which is in contradiction with, new, with the emerging neoclassical theory. So by what rules are you doing that? And they would actually have, they had full surveys where they asked, people just this and um it yielded some answers that 
further contradicted the theory. It was like, uh, yes, we are setting prices. And um, furthermore, um, we generally don't change them too often. Um, we would actually kind of prefer not to raise prices because it alienates our customers. And yeah. that that has been shown to be uh, negatively correlated with um, revenue. Yeah, so price shock causes people not to buy your shit anymore. Duh. <laughs> it's kind of like dirt, but uh... <laughs> but but yeah, it actually. But that that surprisingly obvious statement. Uh... But that that came from that statement is one thing. That's that's a that's a blemish on neo neoclassical economics, to be sure. And these days they deal with that. Say that well, prices are sticky. People don't have all the information they need to move price in the optimal way, which is faster generally than you would expect from what they're doing. So it's like in neoclassical theory, prices need to equilibrate to the equilibrium point by moving more than we see that they're moving. Right. So, but we're not in this optimal state where everyone knows everything. So that's why right. it's moving slower. I want to point out that equilibrium in, in economics requires the abolition of time and complete and universal knowledge of all sides involved. <laughs> it does. They have set, I, I found it, uh, my, my friend Kyle found a paper where they actually stated this because time preference and, and the differential in knowledge and time makes equilibrium impossible to achieve. Um, so yeah, set but in, that aside. Like in, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go in, ahead. In the real world, which is the one that they went out and did the survey in, they say they saw business managers say, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm facing fundamental uncertainty, so I use rules of thumb about whether or not I should increase the price or not. And if I do, it's basically by like the same amount each time. But generally speaking, we don't like to raise prices because it alienates our customers. It causes all sorts of problems. Right. So they so in general. Firms and dealing in retail goods don't like to raise prices. And, and in fact, one thing that that I have noticed, this has even led to a shift of cost from buying commodities, like electronic commodities, like IPs, um, which are weird. They're not calling commodities is only true because they're traded uh into rents right because they can charge a lower amount over a longer period of time and steady their income that's another thing a lot of businesses want to do just like a lot of people want to do they want yeah. to be able to predict their costs and profit gains um yeah they want so, to reduce uncertainty yeah, right so everything's about reducing uncertainty now this is another hit for for actually for both classical and neoclassical economics where Price is supposed to be an epistemic knowledge, something that we figure out through multiple transactions and the, you know, and the invisible hand of the market comes up with an aggregate on a bell curve. And that is your ideal price. And there you go. And what we discover from empirical studies, and I think Stephen King talked about this like 10, 15 years ago. It's just not true. That's not how things work. Mm -hmm. Um and that's not what you're taught in business school. That's only what you're taught in economic school, which is also kind of funny. But yeah. yeah, I should say that like finance and business majors, they they're taught like what actually happens, and econ economic students are taught the the fairy tale, right? About there being um, an, like an auctioneer for every industrial good, right? Like somehow someone could possibly have that index just from from businesses succeeding or failing and. Customers picking yeah, out. On a, their own. Uh, <laughs> having gone through two economics degree, I, I can tell you that outside of that like safe space in the business world, I never saw a single demand schedule or a demand curve being computed by anyone. Right. Like. Uh, yeah, I used so to. It just, it just doesn't exist. So, like the in yeah. So, to back to like kind of historicizing this. Um, mm -hmm. The so these institutional economists. Two of them in particular, um, Gardner, Means, and uh, Adolf Burl in the 20s and 30s, they went and conducted these surveys and they wrote a book called, um, I want to say, The Modern Corporation and the Determination of Profits. Is it Modern Corporation and Private Property? And Private Property. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. 
Thank you. They wrote no that problem. and they introduced the idea of administered prices. Administered prices were in, con in contrast to a more supply demand driven um, opti price optimization procedure, wherein like people who don't know things eventually learn more things about what the optimal price should be, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the administered story seemed closer to the truth and the surveys bore that out. But this result was basically buried over time by um, economists after like the war, the World War II period, like after the New Deal was done and we stopped setting prices and whatnot. Um, by the way, Gar um, Gardner Means went on to be an advisor for the New Deal. So okay. like after after that, um, there was there was a purge in economic uh, economics departments across the country for specifically for socialists and communists. And among them were a lot of like the Keynesians who were really interested in, uh, among other things like chartalism and like which is the precursor to MMT, but also like um, institutional ability to set prices and coordinate the flow right. of goods and services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those ideas were stamped out. So classical Keynesianism and its kind of copacetic-ness with neoclassical economics was kind of created in this time period by getting rid of everybody who was like, but maybe there are such a thing as price control. Question. <laughs> um, yeah, we really, yeah, I know it sounds like a dream, but we really did price controls for like six years. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we had that, the historical, the theoretical experience of doing the surveys and writing a theory about administered prices and then applying some of those theories in government to set price controls later. And then all those people were kind of purged from the academy or otherwise told to leave. And um, there are pockets here and there of what eventually became the post-Keynesian school. Mm -hmm. And some of them kept up with this, doing more surveys that basically um, proved like their important replication studies that said like, okay, the the um the Gardner means study was important, but it still only captured industrial prices of certain sectors. So what if we expanded that? What happens now? And then they're like, oh, it's more of the same. So, so in your paper, you talk about Alan Blinder, uh, who really kind of picked this up and really did this research up until what the 1980s, 1990, somewhere in there. Yeah, I think he ran his study in 1995. Okay. 96. He published it eventually through Columbia Press. Um, Alan Blinder is a mainstream economist. Yeah, so totally he's not, normal. He's a completely mainstream economist. And um, I always like, when I was reading through the surveys that he did, I'm like, man. So I guess he messed up and did science. Like he, he actually met, like he, uh, you know, we're all human basically. And he actually he screwed up and did real science for a change where he actually instead of like math where like... you where all your assumptions are already in the premises and you're just making yeah he actually went out and made observations and then he went back and tried to devise a theory that fit the observations instead of the reverse of that yeah, yeah. instead so... of praxeology or whatever where you really just set out to use math to... well actually in praxeology you don't use math you use deductive reasoning but it right but so a lot of macroeconomics the... is is the same thing but with math so yeah, well, they call them they call them logico deductive models in in the biz, right? For uh, the neoclassicals, which, which uh, I like to call Platonism. But whatever, <laughs> like. Yeah, so Alan Blinder did basically <laughs> the largest study survey to date of pricing behavior at the firm level, and it didn't just confirm the results; it, they passed with flying colors. Mm -hmm. And he was really confused. And he's like, this goes beyond just like sticky prices or whatever. Um, so sticky prices, kind of like... is, just so we define that, you kind of went into it and described it. But that just means prices are sticky because they are the best, but an imperfect epistemic knowledge something or other. Yeah, like in in to put it into a neoclassical mindset, like it's like um, we have imperfect information. So mm -hmm. there is still an objectively optimal price which equilibrates supply and demand that is out there. But because of differences in knowledge between the participants, you have these like 
the price will just kind of stay where it is for a long time, only to jump much later up to where it should be. Right. So, in other words, time exists. Yeah, there's just, <laughs> like, like... it's their way of saying like time is a thing. <laughs> um. Uh. So. Okay, so we have blinder. We get we get we get basically empirical confirmation, maybe even by accident, that the administrative prices thesis is true in certain sectors of the economy. Which sectors again did he prove it for? Well, blinder expanded it to economy wide, but Ed okay, Gardner, so so the, the whole means economy it went from like a relatively narrow set of industrial prices for Gardner means. Mm -hmm. And then it later was expanded to like, okay, now we're going to do retail. We're going to do like the retail sector. And then we're going to do like the, the, the labor market. And it just kind of went on like this. There are actually like periods of time where there's like kind of great flourishing of these surveys. Um, I could have cited many more. Like there's, there's even one for like, they do it for worker cooperatives. These like this group of economists in Brazil did a, a thing on like a pricing survey for like Mondragon style worker cooperatives. And they, uh, they, they work somewhat similarly to, yes. they? Yeah. Yeah. Very similar. Um, yeah. I think it, actually they said that like compared to capitalist firms, they exhibited more price stability. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would make sense actually, <laughs> because they have, uh, it, 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 that's actually knowledge theory that you have more diffuse people making decisions. So, you would have better price stability and probably decent profitability rates overall because there's more people making the semi-arbitrary decision of how much markup you're going to give. Yeah. Um, I um I forget what their their reasoning for it was. If I had to guess, it would be like, well, there were there's no absentee ownership, so you don't have like a required return beyond over and above your own costs, and um, right for people who aren't even working there. So like they can't just set like a return that they get all of a sudden. Right. So there's no required return and thus there's no. Uh, so like, there would be less reason for them to raise the price than there otherwise would be. Right. And, that's and, just the hypothesis. Well, it makes sense. And and I also want to point out one of the one of the hypotheses of the price stability of the time period that we talk about early entrepreneurial capitalism is joint holding firms didn't exist and time preference was set by either co-ops or individuals whereas now time preference is always immediately um <laughs> so because you are you are fiduciarily required to turn a profit at max capacity by law at all times <laughs> because you have that fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. <sighs> I don't know why people don't see why this might be a problem, but um, but regardless, sometimes sometimes you get business re revitalists get all uppity and try to reform this and talk about like social returns or some silly notion like that, but it, that never really goes anywhere because they will not be competitive in the market. So. Um, so that means though, we, we have a, we have administered price insights, which means labor cost, you know, uh, predictable profit margin is attempted, but they exist in this variable world of money where all this flows around in aggregate, right? Mm -hmm. Like nobody can, nobody has all these in any input, like what I was going to tell you earlier is I used to teach people to try to get them to learn how to do a bell curve. I know I'm an English teacher, but I used to work, teach math for a little while. It's weird. Long story. I'm not going to go into it here. And I tried to, I actually used to say, you can use a bell curve to figure out ideal price if you owned a business. And then I realized we're talking to a, to a business friend of mine that I was full of shit, that you don't actually do that ever. And everything's done by markup. And I was like, never mind, kids. I lied. Sorry, the, <laughs> the economist tricked me. Economist, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so okay, we have that. So I should add. Um, so, um, so while this concurrently to the blinder thing, mm -hmm. there's another school of thought developing. Um, concerning inflation led by an economist frederick s lee in the 90s um yeah he's a heterodox, he's a heterodox economist at the university of missouri kansas city 
Um, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he developed, he put out a textbook called Post Keynesian Price Theory. And in it, he has a, his price theory is, um, which I cite, is pretty much forms the back, it's kind of the starting point for my own theory. So he, okay. he was he was he wasn't able to put together inflation theory from his price theory, but I think he was very close to doing so. All right. So so let's talk about this. So we have uh, who's this again? Frederick S. Lee. Oh Fre yeah, Freddie Lee. Okay. So we Fred have Freddie Lee. Lee. Lee, yeah. Um Frederick S. Lee uh come up with a theory of prices. Lee is an interesting figure. He's like Michael Hudson and a few other people who kind of get clustered together as people who saw the stuff that MMTers would figure out 30 years later. Um, mm -hmm. uh, even though they're not MMTers, they don't have the same theory, but it, they are generally considered considered copacetic to that, right? Well, so this brings us to the Fred Lee's point and so I have tried to get people to understand monopoly pricing inflation, uh, demand uh, pull inflation and cost push inflation, just so people under could understand how economists talk, because they just like when economists talk, they just throw the word inflation <laughs> out and just like, just like inflation, <laughs> boo, like boogie man. Also, um, <laughs> another, another linguistic thing going on that I talk about is like, it's kind of just when, when mainstream economists and Unfortunately, also some heterodox economists talk about inflation. It's just kind of like a jam session where you just throw together various parts of existing theories into one thing, and it's very confusing to people. Yeah, yeah, like a part of the demand pull story is merged with a part of the cost push story, and then you know, and then oh, that suddenly we're in quantity theory of money land. Right. Like uh, the the theories are not kept separate. I like to talk about this as uh, as the non-cognitive theory of God as applied to other things, because there's a way in which people would talk about God when you realize that their definitions of God are totally incoherent and you can't actually believe everything they're saying because they would self-contradict. This is, you know, an old platonic trilemma issue. Right. But like if, you know, and it's something that a kid who's thinking about it will actually bring up without even realizing it. Uh, you know, can God, uh, it being omniscient and omnipotent, can he create something that he can't lift, thus invalidating both the omniscience and um, well, it, saving the omniscience, but invalidating the omnipotence, et cetera, and so forth. Um, well, that's the way people talk about money, right? <laughs> this is actually why Marx, you know, my Marxist background uses all this religious, religious talk about the way people talk about money, that it's, that it's a fetish that hides a bunch of relationships um, it is a thing that has its own set of values, but it's hiding a whole lot of other relational things, right? Well, okay, fine, but that's still not going to get you any price theory at all. Um, so what did Fred Lee say was the primary driver of prices? And why should we care about that in, in the way that we break down these different theories of inflation? So just to remind my listeners who may be coming late... We have uh, cost push, demand pool, and quantity theory of money, and then hybrid theories, and then there's the MMT hybrid theory, and then there's some cost push hybrid theories as well. Um, and so, all that. Um, what does Fred Lee's research indicate? His research indicate so he's coming from a place of like, look, he looks at supply chains as socially provisioning one another through selling inputs to people downstream of you so that eventually it winds up at the at the point of sale for the end user and each of them needs to meet their survival constraint basically and they also need to keep the inputs flowing right so the input and by input i mean an input into a productive process to build something else to sell to someone else yeah. Survival constraint for those of you who speak Marxist is socially necessary reproduction minimum. Yeah. Like that would be like the average socially necessary labor. Uh, yeah. The average socially necessary. Yeah. The average socially necessary labor time in compensation to reproduce your labor. That's survival constraint. Uh, right, the reason so, why we use more modern terminology is just, just shorter. Marxism usually takes a sentence to say something like that. Go yeah, ahead. But, um, 
without making any reference to value or anything, he's looking mm. at the prices that they charge each other and noticing through empirical research, obviously prices are quite stable generally. Mm. Um, only sometimes do they get out of whack. But he's like, how... For him, he was not making an inflation theory so much as a theory of prices. So he was like, how are prices set? Let's look at the surveys. Okay, so they had their costs, which are really just prices of other companies. Yeah. So cost, which charged. is prices back to the original part of yeah, the supply like chain. They're, you, you can interpret costs as with without much difficulty as always being a price if you want. So your costs are someone else's price. And then in order for you to socially provision yourself and keep on going as a, as a going concern, a company, um, you need to charge a markup over your costs. Mm-hmm. And you need to reliably do that into the future forever. And it's hard to do that because we live in a world with fundamental uncertainty that you can't model. All you know is the the costs that you incurred in the past and you have forecasts of what it might be in the future. Right. And so, but, so you have in this system, this would make you very open to both endogenous and exogenous shocks. So yes, endogenous so shocks like COVID, endogenous shock is like labor disputes. Like a, yeah, like a, a class, like class warfare, mm. endogenous effect, uh, an input. There's not enough inputs for you to make your output. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just not enough of parts for like to build a car or something. Uh, there's like a chip shortage, like there was during COVID. Like that, they couldn't. Right. They deal, car car dealerships didn't have cars to sell. Right. And then banks didn't have cars to make auto loans on. Right. And, and this condition, no tips. <laughs> right. And this condition leads economists saying stuff like, well, this this whole field of thing has been historically underpriced, but then their whole theory should actually undermine that because nothing should ever be able historically underpriced for long periods of time. So, like, uh, what you know, yeah. Yeah. so that's that's interesting. So what I think I got from this, and I think you say this explicitly, it makes disentangling cost push and demand pull almost impossible. Right? I mean, what I what I wind up at is I don't really see the demand pull story as anything more than cost push with extra steps. Ah, I so think de- so I think so... demand pull is another way of saying there's more orders coming in. People are exercising their effective demand. More orders are coming into you as a business. You've utilized all of your other tools that you want to use before raising prices because raising prices alienates your customers, et cetera, et cetera. So now you're going to raise prices. You're going to break ranks and do it because you have to, because like in the faces of shortages or now, and lack, if everybody's of, lack of doing transportation it also, or whatever, this is what you have to do. And if everybody's doing it kind of sectionally simultaneously, you're also not going to individually as a firm take a hit. Right. right? Like if, I'm if, kind if, of like jumping if, ahead to my theory, but Fred Lee, right. as far as how he saw companies socially provisioning themselves through a pricing procedure was in vast majority of cases, you have your costs, you have what you know are your costs, you have a forecast of your costs, and you have a markup that you need to live on. And the cost plus the markup is what your price will be. Now there are variations on this theme as there always are like in supply chain management, you have like indicative pricing that says you have a model that says you might want to change your price, but people in practice might not, they'll just choose to ignore the model because again, that's scary to do that all of a sudden. You don't want to be the first guy that kind of breaks ranks and raises your prices during a, a period of a period of turbulence in the market or something. So you call this this tendency of cost push to be become demand pull, right? So at the bullwhip effect. So things, something, some kind of either be it, it could be endogenous or external shock, but some kind of shock happens. Price stability is di- is disruptive. Things go up. Then you start seeing other things go up in tandem with that. Some things may not even be directly affected by the general, like by the price increase. Um, and that becomes a demand pool crisis because people not, but that's, I think calling it demand pool is misleading. What it, what it becomes is 
normalized price increase, right? Like people just accept the price increase. Because the one thing that we have learned is deflation is really fucking rare. Like historically and not, you know, like there are deflationary crises, but it's, 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 it's pretty rare. And I used to wonder about this all the time uh, when I was into more, you know, when I was a conservative in the more conventional economics, I'm like, well, what, why does nothing ever cause deflation? Like why is deflation oh. almost non-existent? Like it happens historically, but like it usually takes like a crisis or we're stuck to gold and there is no more gold. Or something like that. Or it has to be engineered yeah. like Bitcoin, but it doesn't happen in in economies that are steady state at all. Yeah, I mean, if you the price dynamics that we see on the long run are either it just stays the same or it goes up gradually and occasionally it goes up rapidly, but then falls later. But why does it fall? So why do why do prices sometimes fall basically? Um right. that sounds like a Batman quote or something. Right, but, but it's interesting because when I look at like when uh, we talk about the end of inflation, what usually we see is just price stabilizing time. We don't actually usually see that much decrease in prices. You do see it sometimes. Right. So like um, in the Great Depression, there was a, a it, right. Uh, the, you know, it's part of why it called that is prices declined, not just for stock, but also for industrial uh, goods and retail goods. And right. there's a lot of like theorizing on why that might happen. It's like, okay, well, if we really believe the administered pricing theory, then we need to figure out why people chose to do that, not from some, not in some abstract way about monetary aggregates or whatever. Um, right. and, and we're also what they not find considering... is like, well, uh, the best guesses that people have are like, it comes down to inventory management. It's like, I don't have as many customers. I need to sell what I have because it costs money to store my goods and to, you know, like to pay people to maintain stuff. Um, basically, this is a way for me to liquidate my inventory so that I have money to pay like my landlord for the commercial space um, to tide myself over for uh, in the wake of a recession or something. Like I foresee fewer customers coming. So I need to, t I need to sell what I have now at a fire mm -hmm. sale, even if I need to in order to have capital to tide myself over through less customers in the future. So you right. have an expectation about lower revenue in the future. That means that you need to have more capital now saved up. Right. So, so if you were to have uh, a rash of bankruptcies, uh, re reacting to a rash of bankruptcies, etc. That, that comes back to that. time as well. <laughs> time, right. time is a very important concept that neoclassicals right. don't seem to treat. Yeah. Yeah. They, and, they, uh, they don't like, MMTers only like situationally treat. All right. So um, I want to make a few points. We're not talking about asset prices and we're not talking about rents, which which do affect inflation in the general aggregate, but cannot be explained this way just before people ask. Well, we um, it remains to be seen. Uh, okay. At the end of my paper, I, I address the fact that asset prices don't really come up. I'm talking about industrial and retail prices right. and that in order for this theory to really work, the theory that along supply chains, um, price, whoever is the first guy to raise the prices can often ripple out in unforeseen ways and cause a general rise in prices from like, say an important supply chain. Um, like say gasoline. Like say for gas, like right. for the petroleum industry or something can cause a rise in costs for other people that eventually causes further price rises. Um, is something like that possible for the asset market too i don't know maybe um i cited a few people uh who are interested in this idea and they go through some like administered pricing of asset markets with traders who follow certain rules for what price they enter into their bloomer machine etc and it's really interesting i just don't know we All need right. more research so let's talk about a couple of, uh, of paradigm shifting sort of things here so one um this implies if we don't really understand price we also probably don't really understand money two <laughs> um just just point that out to people if we don't understand how price works the fundamental epistemic thing that money is used for <laughs> the 
Yeah. What's the logical conclusion we can come to? We don't really understand how money is operating now. Um, I, I have, you know, and it, it's really, you know, as as a person with a, from a, who comes from a anthropological background, but I took a lot of econ classes when I was in college, actually. I was fascinated with the subject. Um, uh, they, they, and for a long time, I actually believed um, the neoclassical like pricing models because the math looks so neat and clean. All right. Um, then I started looking at anthropology and realized that math is never neat and clean like that when you deal with complex systems and humans, even if they're, even if it's <laughs> predictive. So I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. Send me into a crisis. Then the house, then right before the housing crisis by non neoclassical standards, I predicted it just by like looking at business model things. Now housing prices are different. And part of this, part of what's driving that is credit and rents, but still, um, I realized that no theory explain that till after the fact we have good explanations for the crisis now we're 15 years out from when it began um but at the time the only people who had any explanation for what was going on was like an austrian a marxist and Nuriel rabini and they didn't and, and they just agreed that it was happening they didn't agree why um and then most neoclassical economists were basically saying it wasn't possible mm-hmm. I mean, are you old enough to remember this? I don't know, but yeah, yeah, I was um, in college, college yeah, during it. Me too. So this, I, I worked at an insurance job and then, and then uh, went back to college to get my MFA in poetry because I'm so practical. Um, uh, so, so could I this, bring, could yeah, I bring, bring it up. back? Uh, to bring things back to kind of getting from, okay, Lee has a theory of prices. What's the supply chain theory of inflation, though? Um, yeah, what is so it? Like it's essentially that if if an inflationary process does develop, it develops along a specific supply chain from some progenitor price increase that is from a company along that supply chain and it ripples upstream and downstream from them. And in the way the manner in which it ripples upstream and downstream can happen in a few different ways. Among them, the bullwhip effect you mentioned, whereby orders, a, an increase in orders at one end of the supply chain can um, eventually magnify as their input market upstream of them enters successively higher orders amount. And so it's like a whip cracking basically at the end. Um, that's one way in which a uh, price increase could happen. Interestingly, with the bullwhip, it, you don't really see it too much from there. But from other reasons, such as an exogenous stock like COVID-19 or something, all of a sudden you like don't have reliable transport. Like there's no trucking uh, available to get things from the seaport to where it needs to be to get sold by you. Or there's no customers because there's a quarantine, things like that. So those cost increases for those companies are ultimately along supply chains, what drives inflation. So that's the supply chain theory of inflation. And which is remarkably would, intuitive and I don't know why I've never been taught it. Like it's like obvious kind of like yeah, right, if I'm, there's... I'm with you on that. I mean I don't know why I, I don't know why none of my co economics teachers ever even mused about this to me. Um but this is basically compounding the the uh uh uh, a compounding um, cost push model, basically, right? Yeah, and what we thought was demand pull, at least to my eye, really just looks like cost push with extra steps in the sense that, okay, you're receiving more orders and that's certainly putting a biophysical strain upon the supply chain. And the participants in that supply chain a company and its suppliers will do their best to modify how orders are moving between them, both mm -hmm. through time and space, things that neoclassicals don't want to talk about, in order so that they don't need to change prices. But eventually, if it goes on for long enough, one of them will increase their prices in order right. to save their markup so that they, that they see suddenly a very uncertain future. They want to have higher capital to absorb 
a period of lower customer base. And so they'll, eventually they'll break ranks basically. And this will ripple. Yeah, and often if it's if it's enough of a breach of protocol, so to speak, amongst the supply chain, then it often ripples through it. Right. Okay. Now and this would like, and when I don't want I want to cut down on any sort of mystical sounding language. So when I say ripple, I mean one person chose to raise prices and then another and the person, next person re re saw that in response so in yeah. response because it's their like it's their cost increasing right. and they're and so they raise prices to maintain a relative profit yeah. level so at least there's nominally. no there's no woo woo monetary aggregate voodoo going on going on here as much as i like woo monetary aggregate voodoo i agree it's it, we need to understand. <laughs> like this is something you can model i mean um so let's let's tie this back now we haven't talked about value and we're not gonna talk about value guys because value is not the same thing as price um but let's uh even though it would play a role here um let's talk about forex theory because that's really what you've been working on to develop but which is a um a kind of advancement what you guys think is an advancement on the historical anthropological research of people like David Graeber, Michael Hudson, which has been very uh, influential on legal theories of people like Kristen Dawson. Um, and well, I don't know, actually, it's been influential on Dawson, but the people who come up with monetary monetary theory use these separate theories as their historical justification, uh, adding in Ennis's, you know, uh, removal of barter and uh, um uh, Knapp's basic theory of charlism. Um, so, how does this relate to that, and how is this different from MMT then? Hmm. Well, to connect, so our theory of forex is is it's certainly connected to the theory of the supply chain theory of inflation in the sense that if you're certainly if you're a state uh, who is not an imperial power like the US, um, you're always managing your Forex. Um, you have to, because um, people don't really want your money. And um, I'm just kind of rehashing. The yeah, your money's only get... good there unless you have a commodity that everyone needs, like, I don't know, natural <laughs> gas and the it's ruble. It's like, I, I need a good reason to accept your money first. Right. And it's going to be something that I depend upon, like oil, maybe, or um, right. Or, but more likely, I'm just going to give you dollars, and then you're right. going to use the dollars to import things that you need because the dollar is already accepted internationally. Right. So, you, if there was a sudden, unexpected change in the exchange rate that um, made, if you're a company and all of a sudden, totally out of your control, the exchange rate moves against you, so your your inputs from abroad that you need to import and then use to build whatever it is you're selling, like a car or something, um, increase, that's going to make it pretty tempting to increase your price such that your markup is still the same. Whether or not you do will depend on uh, the conditions of your supply chain, but it is a factor in why you might choose to raise prices. Right, so interest you, rates. The, and all ditto I, ditto with interest rates. I think someone in the comments was like, interest right. rates are also a factor in cost. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. These, so these the, are all just cost, cost of, factors. If your cost of borrowing increases suddenly for like short periods of time, like 30 to, 30 to 90 days, uh, absolutely. That will affect your cost structure. It might also be a factor in why you might raise your prices. Right. Which, which I want to explain this. I want to explain a secret of Marxism and the people. This is the difference between variable, capital, labor and fixed capital everything else um variable capital can be changed by work efficiency which is code word for either scaring people into working harder or having a machine reduce the socially necessary labor time um all right which marxists think ultimately would drive would be one of the factors driving down the profit uh the profit rates one of many it's highly debated even with marxism about how that works but i want people to understand this um interest rates is fixed because you don't set it you can't control it so you have to adjust your prices as, as a capitalist in response to it but you'd have to adjust that like any other cost input 
And so if you can't have your labor get more efficient with a machine or by scaring the crap out of them or by having less people do more work, et cetera, and so forth, you have to raise your cost. But notice that now this makes sense because we're not talking about it in these big, you know, macro abstractions. We are looking at the way businesses would actually work, right? And okay. and this isn't about Forex, but I want people to understand that, all right? We're talking about fixed costs or variable costs that are variable outside of your control. Um, mm -hmm. And there are, just like with the other, this is a complex system. So just like with your other cost inputs, there are certainly ways around them in which don't involve raising your price. However, they have limits and eventually it will be very tempting to raise your price if this goes on for long enough. Like if there's interest rate hike like is happening right now, um, a lot of the variable interest rate uh, credit agreements that companies use to finance their operations on the short term are going to increase also. So that's an increasing cost. Um, so basically, they the can try to share. Rate yeah, they could can, actually do the opposite of what they say it does. Yes, which is actually it, no. What it, it very did. it really it really could like MMTers to their credit will sometimes say correctly like raising interest rates is no guarantee for a tool against inflation. In fact, and they're in the Volcker shock. Of course, they, they don't have a theory of inflation, so they don't know how to like say this to its conclusions. But like, right. what you could say is like, okay, the Volcker shock engineered a recession, and the recession recession caused down inflation. I mean, de deflation. But the actual, like, the actual initial increase actually seems to have I had just, no effect or maybe even accelerated inflation rapidly like, rapidly increasing one very important price namely the price of borrowing uh caused many people to go out of business and created a recession yes yeah that will certainly bring prices down in a hurry yeah so so basically the this is what i was getting at at the beginning before we go pivot in the forex when i said powell was was actually kind of backdoor he wasn't saying he was back in Kalecki, but he was like, labor is too strong, which sounds like he's adopting a, a class a class struggle model. Yeah. Uh, well, they did, they did that in Volcker's time also. They right. had like, uh, there's like, um, I don't know if it was the Fed meeting notes, but it was like some high up, maybe the, maybe the president actually. Mm -hmm. They're like, just saying like, yeah, I mean, we need labor's, people make too much basically. That's why, that's why we have inflation. Because we have right. these theories that say that uh, only a wage price spiral with wage wage led like there's a directionality to it is um that that that's the only time in which a general rise in the price level can happen so they had a theoretical underpinning that says that like well workers are always the cause of inflation right which as opposed to 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 wages are a cost which may, yeah, or may like, not wages are wages are the price of labor is another important input and then it goes into everything but it's not it's certainly not the full story as we learned with like the lavoie model right so so for example the labor shortage and s subsequent rise i even mainstream economists have said does not explain all of the current uh inflation. oh yeah and um, interest interestingly i was comparing the 70s inflationary period to now and the mm -hmm. unit labor cost is much higher the unit labor cost increase is much higher in the 70s one. Like, because of neoliberalism, the business community is so used to, to labor getting basically nothing that if they get, like, a normal amount, it's seen as a catastrophe. Right. So, like, the unit labor cost right now is, yeah, you know, it's up, like, 1.9% or something. And But to them, like, historic, they don't they don't remember when it was up six to seven percent in the 70s right but then this this creates another more important theoretical question of like okay well in one case wages were up pretty big and it happened at the same time as an inflationary period but then there's another inflationary period that's almost as bad where wages are not up big right. so were wages ever really the cause right so so with forex for people who don't know forex forex is basically um uh 
Forex is basically what I kind of, it's, it's a more elaborate way of something I intuited from Graber's research. Charterless conditions apply within a society, but they don't apply between them. But money does go between societies necessarily. So societies with A, more production, or B, a mili uh, bigger military, or in the case of the United States, both can compel their currency, uh, but other states just simply cannot do it. Um because they need to buy stuff on the foreign exchange. And if they were able to do it, they'd either have to, frankly, become imperialists themselves or literally take over resources and and subsume other states into them. I don't really know how else you would do that. I've heard other theories like, we can do you know, unions of, uh, of monetary zones. And I'm like, but you just told me that didn't work with the EU. So I guess if you, it's just some rule changes, but why would that happen? What, why would capitalists agree to that, et cetera, and so forth. So, so like Forex goes and says, okay, your guys are right. Turtleism applies within, within a system because, because of the, of the way, uh, um, uh, trust and credit and debt works within a uh, within a relatively close system um but people don't live in relatively close systems so the state can't control all this and so foreign exchange rates really matter for cost and smaller states are going to be at a disadvantage um and what i find interesting about this is this is freaking obvious to me like ever since i read graber's book um when he's like well barter uh, barter is what happens between hunter-gatherer groups, but but gift economies is what happens within them. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> like, <laughs> we trust each other in a group. We don't trust each other when that tribe over there doesn't speak the same language as me, so they better give me shit that I want, and then I will give them shit. But, like, the credit and debt relations are going to precede that because they're going to be internal to your group. You would have already worked that out. Probably... Not in other gatherer situations, actually, but in very early agricultural situations and some hunter-gatherer situations that generate surplus, you would also come into this uh, arrangement, um, right? Yeah. So a modern analog to like this more trust-based relationship is the trade the trade credit market among uh, people within supply chains will offer um, pay like buy now pay later essentially mm -hmm. amongst each other and trade credit as it's called is a huge part of like business to business uh purchases right it, so it, you it, can have like you can receive your inventory and then 30 days later 30 to 90 days generally later you can pay for it uh there's no interest rate they give you a discount if you do early payment right it's to incentivize sales basically so you're incentivized sales at a slight profit loss uh, to yeah, stabilize if you're willing, it. If you're willing to move all this inventory for me at like a big batch size, yeah, sure. You can have it now and you can pay me later. And there's no interest rate, actually. Right. And, 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 and I'll so even that's, give that's it a, to you that's at a, a negative interest rate way. if you pay it early, right? Like... Uh, you get a discount, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is one potential way around the interest rate hike that they have that wouldn't involve raising prices to to customers but that wouldn't work for very long so if the interest rate hike yeah, you is... can if it just goes on and on like a volker style then yeah that wouldn't work right so so this is why for example the slight interest rate raise in 2007 didn't really do that much um yeah so or, it maybe crashed the economy but didn't do that much ditto, to cost ditto <laughs> the 2018 one Right. That they attempted to normalize back to 3%. Didn't work. So what I'm learning is my whole mystification and fetishization thesis about money also just applies to economics in general, that we are hiding obvious things by depending on aggregates, but not looking at things that the aggregates would actually tell you. Yeah, well, it... Um... Neoclassicals and unfortunately also some heterodox economists will get lost in these like basic questions of time and space <laughs> will get lost in the monetary aggregates and the inflation indexation talk about like oh is it transitory is it not mm -hmm. who cares like look at what this the supply chains have to accomplish in a set amount of time with a set amount of biophysical resources in certain locations. Yeah. And then see if that 
can actually be accomplished in the time frame they promised. Right. If the it's promises just... break down, eventually the prices go up. And so sectionally, this could have all kinds of effects, but it wouldn't be even across the board in, instantaneously, right? So like, let's say COVID happens, you have a bunch of manufacturing die downs. Oh, also, we finally went through all of our excess wood stock, uh, which is a big, a big one. I don't know why. Yeah. Oh, lumber uh, prices. Yeah, lumber price is interesting because it like part of the reason why it went up was like these really these like hyper specific inputs like this industrial glue that they use to to create plywood. Mm -hmm. There's it just wasn't it just wasn't there. So, I mean, you can't have the productive process and plywood prices skyrocketed as a result. Right. So so what we what we're seeing here, my friends, is that accounting and logistics can do wonders for understanding economics in a way that perhaps economics does not tend to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> duh. But I mean, it, it, it's funny because I mean, this, this is where my Marxist impulses and my old conservative impulses actually overlap. Cause I used to be like, but businesses operate on, on microeconomic conditions, not macroeconomic conditions. Like, and I can explain even aggregates like value through accounting way easier than I can your weird information systems that are all based on optimization and the non-existence of time and some other. And also, by the way, it is perfectly, it is perfectly valid practice for most econometrics people to sneak in assumptions for optimals in how they model their numbers in ways that when you realize that you're like, what? Like you're allowed to do that. You could just set a constant oh, yeah, that's rate. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> that's done at the modeling. Like, that's like done before the data in the modeling phase. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like, uh, and models. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you can't. No. Like, you're basically pretending <laughs> like cost inputs don't change in time. Like, <laughs> um, or or in or in space for that matter. So right. like the yeah. like right now with the so like China is like shutting down again uh there's a big pile up in ships there it matters it matters where shit is as well as when so yeah. you have a bunch of ships that just can't they there's nowhere for them to berth in the port so they can't they can't get where they need to be and then trucks can't go to the port to meet goods in a timely fashion cuz well, there's a variety of reasons, but like you know, there's a lot of turnover in the trucking industry because wages are down after deregulation and whatnot. And then, um, but then there's certain the way our economy is set up. There's not only these like highly um, path dependent supply chains that are developing, but there's also this more general phenomenon that's called geo industrial clustering, mm -hmm. and in the in the the supply chain lit where certain types of biophysical resources and personnel will be in certain places at certain times and the productive processes there such as like at a port are highly centralized not because of some optimization routine but just because of the specific geographical qualities of where you are in space and then the time it takes to get to places yeah so this material is near this port so it's like, I don't care, uh, you know, you could offer whatever price you want. If it's just not where you need it to be, you're not getting it. Right. Like, I don't know, like Sapphire. Stuff, right? <laughs> it I sounds stupid to say, up. but like, that's at the level of discourse that we need to start from again with this. I mean, it, it's funny because I keep on finding that when we talk about economics, I'm just talk about basic accounting, talk about logistics. And a lot of this stuff becomes obvious that seems to be hidden from you because of sneaking assumptions in the modeling um relying on aggregates but not explaining the inputs into that aggregate and what it's actually telling you and then pretending things like time and space don't exist like <laughs> it, just in a world without logistical problems like yeah, yeah. um <laughs> Things, Which, the right the right thing that was ordered needs to be in the right place at the right time. It's harder than it appears at first. Right. And this all, everyone economist who, who might listen to this might go, duh, but also then X. But then I'm like, 
But your X doesn't account for this. Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, some of them will go duh, but then we go right back to modeling without time and without space. Right. Right. It, it, it's when, when I realized I, it was the realization, for example, that a lot of people modeled input cost at constant cost at that current period of time and not over time. And I'm like, what? Like a business is a business cares about what it paid to make something at the time it paid to make it, not what it cost when it sold it. Like, <laughs> yeah. And like um, with the with the port thing, you might think like, oh, well. Okay, so it's all centralized because they're dumb. And it's like, no, they there's there are unique geographic features that force it to be in that specific geo-industrial configuration. Right. That uh, um like California uh, is weird. Despite all prices. our ingenuity, um we they just can't get around, at least not yet. Like California's weird water crisis, but the fact that it has so many microclimates that we can grow vegetables inconsistently. That's one example of this uh, in agriculture. We're like, okay, it doesn't seem optimal. It's kind of dumb on on a on a few levels because California's not water secure. Um, but there's no other place to produce this amount of vegetable at this cost this much of the year. That's why it's there. Um, uh, it wasn't, you know, sometimes sometimes it is like sometimes like growing way too much corn is actually the result of of industrial policy left over from the new deal but but in general these things are optimized uh oh and not to mention climate change right yeah are optimized <laughs> for the time that They're they start drive. to exist right yeah but but those same chains will not be optimized later for things like climate change and political instability you know i mean a prime example of this right now is we use a lot of stuff related to this war is grain. Mm -hmm. All right. America has enough grain to not see the rise to bread, but it's also going to be selling grain to other, to markets at a markup that are now underserved by, uh, well, aren't served at all by all the fellow grain in Ukraine, which would normally go to North Africa. So now, uh, they're going to be bidding up because they don't have any. You can't, again, this logistic time and space thing really matters, but it affects everyone because this is these these chains of webs are infinitely complex, right? Like, that's why I think people avoid looking at this as individual steps, because like you do get into like um, so everyone's doing administrative pricing. But like it really is almost like the butterfly caused a drought and and Botswana, which messed up this this other thing over here, which caused this key mineral substrate not to be delivered to China, which caught, you know, and mm. it compounds. Mm. And uh, the one thing I will say about a capitalist economic system is that it encourages very, because of that whole variable profit thing I was mentioning, on labor and on trying to get your supply, uh, your supply chains as thin as possible, it makes them really fragile. Like early capital is very robust, actually. It has a lot of redundant features, but as these as these pricing changes change, it gets harder and harder to maintain profits. And so they start cutting out those parts and you do like on demand thing and all this weird billing shit and and you don't warehouse and 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 so then any external shock becomes more a, more of a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's... I kind of think of like the industrial world in World War II versus the industrial world now. If war had happened at the same scale, way more of the economy of the world would automatically turn off overnight. Yeah, it's a complex system. But even at so I took you through one supply chain mm -hmm. of just like, you know, a few nodes. And even that you can get some really chaotic things going on. So with and by i mean chaotic in like the mathematical sense mm -hmm. so like you have very few initial conditions that when you such as price mm -hmm. quantity location you know the speed at which you work yeah. and then uh, take those four set them at a certain set of initial conditions and yet you can have really chaotic outcomes from that because if you have one person with all of those and you also have five or six other people doing it right um there's a lot of ways in which those you know your variables multiply exponentially 
Yeah, so the system becomes very overdetermined and then it interacts in very chaotic ways. And supply chain managers are certainly hip to this. Like they have, I was actually reading a piece of a guy that incorporates, by a guy that incorporates um, chaos theory from math into supply chain management. And they say that not only, this has been a known issue, like chaos has been a known issue in supply chain management for a while. And there are like some sophisticated models for really big corporations that incorporate it already. And they say that um, far from trying to minimize it, they just take it as a given. And sometimes it can even be a boon. In that like, uh, if you hit like a patch of turbulence in availability of inputs for you, it's also happening for your competitor often. So it can give you a competitive advantage. Yes, like if you um, modulated like your batch size or something a certain way, you might be able to take advantage of instances of chaos. Or mm. in other words, chaos is a ladder for some <laughs> some some or occupants some... along a supply chain. So so we have the little fingers of the supply chain world and the logistic managers, and they're kind of constantly at war. Um... <laughs> yeah. So like um, and. There's some precedent in other in other um, areas of knowledge, like mm. um, fighter jet design apparently takes advantage of chaotic flow. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I knew that actually. That but... was like one of the like the earliest applications of chaos theory to like a, a physical like a real world. Of course, it was like to problem. kill people. That's yeah. So like the, the um, you know, upon like the accelerate something like the acceleration of the plane uh is aerodynamically unstable and that's actually a good thing because it makes the acceleration kind of burst along in um manageable but also unexpected ways that a pilot can use to their advantage in the dogfight or something all right so, so yeah, it's, it's similar to that with supply chains right so so basically you have an international exchange theory of currency and a supply chain theory of inflation which is a which shows that uh, cost push does drive most inflation, but is effectively going to look like demand pull because so much of the purchasing chain is not actually at the consumer end. It's in these different stages of the supply chain, which also makes sense, right? Because because I, I actually try to tell somebody, like the consumer end part of capitalism and all this money flow is actually like, a small and a small portion of how all this money is moving around. It's just but, one part of the story. Yeah, it, it, it's the final part of the story, and not even it's probably not even it's not even the most important one, frankly. Um, so, uh, uh, so by the way, this this is why I pretty much discount supply side anything. Um, <laughs> um, or excuse me, demand side anything. And, yeah. Yeah. Hey, we're in like a supply side. Yeah. Supply side economics doesn't is kind of triggering mm. for a lot of people, but like that's I guess that's what we're doing. Right. <laughs> um yeah. Just in a different sense. Um so we, there's a lot of things we can learn from this politically, I think. Um but one of which is that money supply in and of itself isn't going to necessarily immediately affect all this at all. Um, or it, it, its effects may be really delayed over time. Um, that, that labor struggle will drive this, but it's one of many costs in the supply chain. Uh, so as is, um, as is inflation, and basically when people try to use, uh, not inflation, uh, raising interest rates, um, when people try to use raising interest rates, it's like fighting fire with fire. It's basically having a recession to stop a other kind of recession, question mark. Uh, yeah, so... and it's based upon their usage of, of raising interest rates in their toolbox for combating inflation is based upon the theory that removing money will cool down the economy. It, they use like this very woo woo language that is it uh, is kind of in a demand pull mindset 
Um, but what, and they're just looking at, okay, well, when we've raised interest rates in the past, sometimes prices went down and yeah. they looked, they said, well, it happened at the same time. So one must be causing the other one. Although it usually doesn't happen at the same time. So. Yeah. There's a, well, then they say like, oh, okay, well, there's a lag. Right. So um, we're trying to estimate how much the lag is. And, and that it, lag happens like to correspond the... with a, always correspond with a recession. Which is another thing the MMPers are right about. It's like, huh, let's see. Why did this finally work? Oh, we had a recession. I wonder, is it your interest rates of the recession that put deflationary pressures on the supply chain? Yeah, it's like, uh, was it the interest rate going up or was it no customers all of a sudden? Right. Hmm. Hmm. You know? Um. Actually, I think it's funny because this is one of the area where the Austrian economics and then like some post uh, heterodox and some and some Marxists actually all kind of agree. It's weird uh, versus neoclassicals. <laughs> I like but, when uh, different different groups of like of people who hate each other of economic, <laughs> <laughs> sure like will agree on something for radically different reasons. Right. Like uh, my other favorite one is like Marxists hate rent, so we hate IP. Uh, Austrians hate government, so they hate IP. So, like, <laughs> because they realize that IP requires governments to enforce rents. So, like, <laughs> yeah. for those of you who don't know, IP is intellectual property, and it effectively is only enforceable by by uh, by force um, through legal fiat. So, because otherwise, you can just copy it and break copyright law infinitely. Um. Uh, hence why everybody's moving to right to not selling you MP3s, but to having you just buy a, a, a cheap rent for all of it forever, even though it's totally screwing up the produ uh, the producer side of the market. Um, okay, well, thank you for coming on, Steve. Um, you got you and uh, JM Cologne, and maybe some other people over there at Strange Matters will be back. We are going to be talking about the legal theories of Kristen Dawson. Uh, and their uses and abuses, uh, probably in the middle to end of May. Um, uh, so, so if you like this kind of content and our, and our, you know, what I like to call a Marxist and some other weird heterodox economic person sits down and talks about stuff, uh, which I should probably just have entitled this podcast, a Marxist in X sits down and talks about whatever. Um, uh, that's what we'll be doing. Um, Steve, I really, I, people need to check out the magazine, check out both the Forex and, and notes towards the theory of inflation. I thought they were really smart. Some people I know who have been listening to me, um, some of my, uh, some of my fans, uh, who follow monetary theory. A lot of them were MMTers are maybe still are MMTers, but do admit that I have some, some pointed critiques. Uh, read this and also thought it was helpful. So, um, and what I love about it is like it demystifies a lot of this stuff for you because once we get to the point where we can talk about what's actually happening, it's easy to model and easy to verifiably check. Uh, it's falsifiable. And yeah. I, I hope someone does falsify it so that we can learn something new. Right. Like someone just needs to do some more surveys and figure out if it doesn't work or not. Um, all right. Well, thank you for coming on, Steve. And like I said, if you guys are fans of Strange Matters, go check out their magazine. Uh, and they will be regulars around these parts. So there's a bunch of people who are becoming regulars over here on the VARM blog world. Uh, um, uh, the TIR has the Varm blog expanded universe. I think I just have the Varm blog black hole. I mean, the Varm blog TIR has the TIR expanded universe. See, I'm being a narcissist today. And uh, Varm blog has the Varm blog black hole where I suck in all your interesting ideas. Bring them to me. <laughs> all right. Uh, so check that out. You can find uh, Strange Matters and the article in the show notes. Um, I'm going to do some Patreon stuff. So let's say goodbye to Steve. Bye, Steve. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Oh, yeah. And uh, um, if uh, there's going to be a leak in the, in the fundraiser in the chat, and I will also uh, add that to 
the show notes as well. Um, oh, I should when say, is, um, when's sorry, the fundraiser the, ending? The, yeah, our, so our fundraiser ends on April 30th, and you can find it at tinyurl.com slash strange matters. And our Twitter handle is at strange underscore matters for you can go there for updates. Right. It's a co op. And, uh, they and we're a worker co op. 100% worker co op uh, owned and controlled. Yeah. It's, you know, it's still capitalist, but it's better than most forms of capitalism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, but you know who you're giving it to, and they are doing some interesting popularizations and synthesis of research, and eventually. Hopefully, I'll be able to do more of their own original research and not just synthesize. Um, but that requires resources, unfortunately. Um, so, thank you, Steve. And uh, check it out. And I will put a link to that in the show notes and post. So, see you later. All right. I just have to do my no my normal Patreon uh, shout-outs because I got a bunch this month. Um, uh, so, these are Khan il Kahanans. These are the people who... Uh, have say in episodes meaning they can ask me to do an episode uh one one time per year if you're interested uh that's usually for patrons only i do two patrons only episodes a month uh usually one stream and one other episode uh and patrons also get at any level audio access to all things as soon as it's done um before it goes out to the public for free um and sometimes some additional stuff that i cut out uh, where I go on a weird rant or something is actually in the Patreon stuff. I try to keep the bulk of the educational material for free, though, and I want to thank my patrons for that. So let's thank the Khan El Kahanans for their donations. Um, that is Andrew Stephen Ro uh, R. I'm not going to say your last name because I don't want anyone to harass you. A uh, soup, Reed R. Nueva, um, Alan A. Nathan G and uh, Brandon R. Thank you guys so much for enabling what I do here. Um, uh, I hope that I will continue to bring you stuff like this in the future. But uh, um, if you are so inclined, go go and help the, the Strange Matters guys out. Um, uh, they probably needed to get their stuff launched more than I do. So... Take care and have a good evening. And I'm going to leave you with the chill clothes, um, at least on the live show.